Again, hello from Voices of Faith. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Chantal Goetz. According to a 1998 study, 30% of the sisters surveyed had experienced one or more forms of sexual abuse, mostly at the hands of priests, but occasionally also at the hands of outsiders or even fellow sisters. Mistrusted, accused, victimized, expelled from communities, those who experienced sexual abuse in the church context very often go through additional sufferings when they try to denounce the crime. Today, we will listen to courageous women testimonials who overcame their silence and will talk about the sexual abuse they experienced by priests, but also by their fellow sisters. We, as a community, need to listen to them, believe them, and show them our unconditional solidarity. And this is just a first step to justice. Being a sister is a wonderful experience, even though sisters may face many of the same challenges as everyone else. Sisters even share the experience of sexual abuse. According to a 1998 study, 30% of the sisters surveyed had experienced one or more forms of sexual abuse, mostly at the hands of priests, but occasionally also at the hands of outsiders or even fellow sisters. So, you should know which red flags to watch out for. Usually, sexual abuse is a gradual process. It starts with disrespecting your boundaries. That disrespect can come from a single person or it can be a widespread attitude in your congregation. For example, when sisters can't set boundaries and they are unable to use phrases like, I don't want that, this is a red flag. That atmosphere makes you vulnerable to all kinds of abuses, sexual abuse included. When there is uninvited talk about sexuality, this is a red flag too especially when this happens in a one-on-one -on -one situation or in a spiritual context like a retreat and very particularly when this happens in confession. Your confessor must not ask you any questions of a sexual nature during confession. If he does, this is a red flag and possibly a crime in canon law known as solicitation. If this happens to you, you can report him and find another confessor. When you work for a priest, Always be aware of what is part of your task and what is not. Sexual favors or intimate physical or emotional contact are not part of your task. If he demands it anyway, that is abuse, and it is also a valid reason to report him. Sadly, not all sisters are being protected from sexual abuse or even rape. Sometimes, victims remain silent because they feel guilty and are afraid of being shamed. However, it is important to note that it is the person who initiated the sexual contact who is to blame, all the more when that person is superior because then the act constitutes an abuse of power. Sisters who are being coerced into sexual acts are not to be blamed. They are victims. When there is no consent, there is no responsibility. When a sister has gone through this experience, she deserves the support of her superiors and her community to deal with the trauma, receive appropriate therapy, and report the perpetrator to the secular and ecclesiastical courts if she wants to. However, not all congregations are ready to assist a traumatized sister in that way. Some are afraid of the perpetrator or even complicit or ignorant. This can have devastating effects. Some communities have been sensitized and have learned to deal differently in similar cases. But how do you know if your community has? We suggest you address this issue early on in your formation. If you speak with your superiors and fellow sisters about the risk of sexual abuse of nuns, and it turns out that they are not prepared to deal with these issues, this is a red flag. If, however, your community is aware of the issue and ready to protect you against abusive behavior and even to stand by a sister's side should the worst happen, 
then you have the best protection you can have. Hello? I can't hear. Marilyn was 12 years in a community founded in 2000 and approved by the Catholic Church as a female branch of the Order of St. Augustine. The interview was conducted with Camilla Bustamante, a Chilean journalist. We respect Marilyn's decision that her face will not be shown. Marilyn, thank you for your courageous voice. Bienvenidos a todos. Mi nombre es Camila Bustamante. Welcome everyone. My name is Camila Bustamante and I'm a journalist. Today we will talk about some aspects concerning sexual abuse inside church context. It is a reality affecting many women worldwide and most often these women keep silent. Today we will talk with Marilyn who is a survivor and a victim of sexual abuse by a priest of her congregation. He he is actually still part of this congregation and the same goes for her and this is the reason why she today will be kept anonymous. We want to protect her identity in order for her to continue working over the various trials. Marilyn, thank you very much for being here today with us. I understand that it is not easy for you to talk about these topics uh, because this actually makes us newly live this sad episodes. Thank you for being here. And I would like to start by, with a question concerning an aspect of sexual abuse. We know that we have been talking about the last step of abuse of power. Actually, abusers prepare victims to abuse. And in this particular context, I would like to ask you how did the relationship with this priest develop? How did this power abuse express? Yes, this priest actually came to know me when I was 16 and it was a moment where I was part with my family of a lay movement and I was coming close to the movement of Sodalicio and I was very young. Uh, I had been working for two years inside the religious world and it wasn't still not clear to me how to work with Sodalicio. Uh, with this very military approach. It was very hard for me and it was a very hard stage of my life. And when I came to know this priest, uh, we spent many hours talking. He was very affectionate to me. He talked to me, calling me my child. And as I talked with him, uh, I really felt having a trusting person. He called me my child and everything that I told him really was understood and this developed this peculiar relationship, this trust and complex relationship that we had. Uh, I really felt I could trust him and I met him some weeks after when I had already started uh, the my, my process with my congregation and we met uh, for a very short meeting but uh, again 
he had said something that really struck me and I really trusted him. He said to me that he would have prayed for me. And he said he would have prayed for me to go over the first stage of the my initiation so that we could have met shortly and my entrance uh, in the congregation was really complex and i believe anyway that already in that moment we had already created a first bond when i exited the community uh, for the first time it was very hard for me and I was very struck by what had happened uh, by this initiation session. And so I called the priest uh, who I completely trusted uh, and he said, okay, there's no problem. Uh, no, don't worry, we will meet soon. And the day after I came to his office and I told him everything that I had lived, I cried so much. And I remember that during this first meeting, he was really affectionate and kind to me. I was crying and he started hugging me, patting my hand, my, he my head, and I was crying for what had happened to me. And I didn't really pay much attention to what was happening. And two weeks after when we met again, he he was very attentive he was very careful he actually wrote me many texts and his coming closer to me was increasing and for me he was an important person and i felt alone and i asked him to be my spiritual director and did you need to go to him to be to feel safe from a spiritual point of view to understand what god was saying to you how was re this relationship created from a spiritual point of view this priest talked to me about many passages of the scriptures of the bible and at the same time boundaries were not so clear anymore it was my confessor my spiritual director but also my friend and when we came to the point of spiritual interpretation he also talked to me saying my child you don't know how much i love you and he explained to me that god had placed me in his life for a specific purpose because he wanted him to be loved through me and this is what something that he highlighted many times and this represented a very high responsibility for me and apparently what i was saying what i was showing which was uh, quite normal linked to someone that i estimated and linked to someone that i valued he said it was a manifestation of god's will and there my confusion began and he started sending me text messages two three times a day even in the very morning just to say good morning how are you and this bond was increasingly strong and most often with religious songs he also sent me the lyrics there was a song in particular where he said you love me you want something more from me the lyrics were becoming more and more ambiguous and i was reading these text messages and i felt so strange but he was saying to me that i was my child you are my child and he highlighted my saying to me that you are mine it was actually kind of a joke even if it was sometimes frightening for me but i was not able to stop this process and sometimes i really felt guilty uh, i felt i was the one uh, thinking negatively and this is something that uh, many people wonder about uh, and also ask victims of abuse why didn't you report what was happening when 
we, when you ac actually come to sexual abuse, why didn't you report it? What does it happen at an interior level? Why weren't you able to report? What happens in your mind? Well, I must admit it's not so easy to answer this question and it's really hard for me and what what we lived and I did I really don't repent uh, reporting the priest and it was really hard for me and I always say that the price of truth is really high. Uh, actually truth costed me everything and there is something fundamental that we need to value it is authority he had an authority over me and i trusted him as a my spiritual director and everything is so unclear when we talk about abuse it's so hard to distinguish the various boundaries i was so confused and it was very hard for me to identify at the abuse I was living in. And over the years, apparently I was in love with him. And this was the reason why I actually allowed these actions. It looked like something mutual. Yes, exactly. It looked like on the one hand, I was happy with these actions, but this is not true. This was not something that happened overnight he was someone saying that he wanted to take care for me uh, he talked to me about spiritual things saying that god that god's plan was has to be together and and at the center he always put love and everything was so confused to me uh, what is love what kind of relationship do i have with this person i gave him authority as a priest as a friend even as a director but then I ended up being so confused and puzzled. I wasn't sure about what was happening and I felt so guilty. And, and I asked myself, am I in love with him? I actually felt so strange. I wasn't in love, but why do I allow him to touch me? Why am I not able to say, stop it? And at the same time, I felt guilty, profoundly guilty saying that I was to blame for the infidelity of this priest. I was inside a wind of desperation and you really feel trapped and you increasingly allow other actions because you are not able to react. You feel welcome in a way that actually traps you and you have nobody to tell what you what is happening to you because when you try to speak about it everyone says well you are the woman you are the one who needs to stop this phenomenon it's up to you to stop it you are what you are a woman and you are looking for attention and this is something that even women tell you you find then that this priest actually abused other women people who were actually attending the church or the places where it worked and then you actually discovered that even other priests of the congregation abused your fellow sisters and this was known to the authorities of your congregation and i would like to ask you marilyn what did these authorities do what have they been doing because we know that this priest and the other priests actually continue perpetrating abuses uh, but they also continue working serving mass and so on i would like you to explain us what is the attitude of the authorities of which you are part and how did they approach this case well i actually talked for many times with my superiors about what was happening to me and at the very beginning in a very unclear way because i felt puzzled and i really i'm really sorry about the fact that 
they were not able to help me ever since 2013, the first time in which I talked to them. I didn't find any real support. And my report actually came in 2014, the, the year after. And it was so sad. This was a terrible abuse and this investigations actually involved other priests in my monastery and authorities are asking people in my community to report and when they asked for this information i started talking with my lawyer and i understood that this was an abuse and naming it as an abuse was really an epiphany for me because I really realized what was happening. It was very sad, but it was also a source of joy. When I talked with my superior at the moment, she started telling me that there was actually a problem. At the beginning, she said that there was no problem, but at that moment, she started understanding that there was something not working. She talked to me about another sister who had similar problems, and this sister had explained it six years ago, but nothing had been said up until that moment. And now I was being said that there was the possibility to report and seven sisters of my community also reported. And when the trial started and when the process of the report started, the community didn't comment anything. We sisters had to continue in our daily life. And this was really hard for me. After two months, I asked for a temporary exit from the community to relax a bit and i really want to relax i couldn't sleep inside the monastery and the community asked me to exit for six months and this was really a hard hit for me because i felt abandoned but at the same time i said to me well no you really deserve this pause you have been producing negative thoughts but what do you expect from your community? And today, after one year has passed, I believe that the most important element is the community to realize what they did and treating me with dignity, seeming as they didn't in the past. They need to accompany me in a Christian way because I need to take a decision. And I know that this decision needs to involve my love for God, but also loving me, not allowing anyone to hurt me. And I believe not to deserve a place where I was so hit after my report when I was so vulnerable. Thank you, Marilyn, for this conversation. I know that this is a very sensitive topic. I hope that it will be possible to continue talking about these topics because it's important to understand what is behind these abuses. It's important to prevent abuses. If there are no safe places in the Catholic Church, these things will continue happening. Thank you, Marilyn, for this conversation. Thank you, and thank you, Voices of Faith, for having defined this place for us. Camila Bustamante, Bustamante. she's a Chilean journalist. Thank you for interviewing uh, Marilyn. Camila began to internalize the issue of ecclesial abuse in 2015, when the Sudalicio case broke out in Latin America, specifically in Peru. Because of her membership in this movement, so she was a member of this movement too, and her journalistic role, she began to investigate cases of abuse of women. Camilla, the Vatican, Pope Francis, bishops, priests, and many Catholic women are convinced that the institution is doing enough to protect women religious against any form of violence. As the journalist, what do you say about this? Thank you very much, first of all, for having allowed me to be here with you. Well, concerning your question, Chantal, I believe 
that it is really important talking about these topics and I know that we actually talked about a lot concerning topics related to abuses from priests, but it is fundamental to continue these conversations because many women are not able to talk because they were victims of abuse themselves. And often there is a vision of women. I don't want to say in all cases, but men more, most often that women actually cause abuse. And this vision is something that we need to change. It's important to do it by means of the various witnesses, by means of what or the stories of the victims. And I believe that we have been working a lot. There is still much to do, but we are inside the right process and we are coming closer to a real movement and a real change in our reality. It's important to, pre to prevent abuse, con also understanding the problems existing in the various spaces in the parishes in the communities it's important to talk about it to prevent abuses from happening when you write about the issues of abuse of women in the church what kind of reaction do you get from people so when they read it in in newspapers, in the social media, what are the reactions? La reacción más común es no creerle a la víctima. Well, the most common reaction is not believing the victim. We are living in a world when where victims are challenged above all when they are adult people. And the question is why? Why didn't you report? What do you want? Do you want money? Do you well, want being recognized? What do you want? This is the question which is being asked. And it's a very painful question. This is the first reaction doubt. And secondly, from another group, we witness a reaction of hate uh, towards the church institution. It is said, well, this happened because the woman was going to the church and there is rage against the institution for the lack of prevention and for the lack of measures allowing people to report. And at the same time, there's another group again which tries to understand the whole details of the abuse, exposing their points of view to the victim. This is what I see most of all when reports come to the authorities uh, and there are other people who really feel a great rage towards the church and they exploit the situation and there is also this tendency trying to understand the whole the whole shades of abuse and this is a danger for victims because they are not reporting due to a willingness to be famous but it is important to to really take care of them. It's important people to understand that reporting doesn't mean exposing a person 100%, but because victims really deserve being protected. Thank you, Camila. If the audience here has more questions, she might be available at the end. Our next testimonial comes from the United States. We respect also here her wish not to be recognized. The sister is still within her congregation, but nevertheless talks courageously about her experienced abuse. She has chosen to tell the truth. Thank you, sister. Um, schizophrenia is a way of thinking about the world. 
Those afflicted often live in a delusional world where the only truth is the one created within their minds. That truth is often not a consensual reality. It is a truth created to hide what the psyche can no longer tolerate. I lived in an alternative external reality in a situation my mind could not yet had to tolerate in the service of beginning to complete my life goals, or so I thought. My dream as a young woman was to assist in influencing a 1960s world swept up in wars, civil rights, and economic poverty. In my mind, it was a choice between life in the Peace Corps or life in a convent. My dreams seemed consonant with my vision of religious life, dedicated to working to make a difference. It was the 1960s, and Vatican II was creating a lively and expansive way to be present in the world as a member of an apostolic religious community whose stated mission was to bring vision to a world lost in war and hopelessness. I needed to find out if this was my path. So began my life as a novice in an apostolic community of religious women. If it did not work, my next step was the Peace Corps. Unfortunately, my life in the beginning stages of being in a religious community would leave me frozen, silent, and determined to make it work, given all that I had endured to join. No one, and I mean no one in my life, thought it was the right choice for me. My arrival from urban Boston to a distinctly rural Midwest culture was a potent, though not clearly understood by me, challenging change. I was joining a group of young women, many of whom had been in the convent since they were 14 years old. I was a college graduate who managed school, a job, money, and a group of wonderful friends. The distinct and exceedingly small rural worldview of a new surrounding culture silenced me early in this cultural change. The grooming of silence intertwined with the experience of a novice directress who set up a system of sexual and psychological abuse. The novice directress physically viewed or touched her victims and brutally persecuted those novices who suspected the abuse of their peers. These persecuted young women experienced mental and emotional assault for their closeness to the victims. Novices who experienced physical and psychological abuse lived in a simultaneously insane making, highly de destructive abuse cycle creating, in quotes, schizophrenic confusion and mental destruction whose effects were to last a lifetime. My story continues in the novitiate, located in a wing of our mother house where no one else lived. Isolation allowed the abuser to create a system where she could perpetuate her abuse on both kinds of victims. The victimization cycle started with a novice director's visit to my bed. One evening, she came to my bed as I was taking off my top and bra and stood naked from the waist up. She came close to my bed to have a conversation. It was a shock to see her standing there. Her room was opposite mine and she could see where I was in the process of undressing. She planned this move and she stood there having a smiling, friendly conversation with me while leeringly appraising my body. Stunned and speechless by her presence, I became frozen. On subsequent evenings, I thought that I must not have passed the, in quotes, breath te breast test as she moved on to other novice victims. Soon after this abuse, she began verbally and psychologically assaulting me in many situations, inducing a deep sense of self-hatred and complete confusion. It was a crazy place to be a focus of her attacks. 
I was so confused all the time. It was a cycle of projected hatred that I internalized, having been told many times that no one would ever like me or would ever want to live with me, and I believed her. What I later learned is that the close friendship I had with another novice was dangerous to the perpetrator, as I might find out about her continuing assaults on my friends and other novices. My friend wanted to kill herself by jumping off the eighth story of our mother house building. I spent months trying to prevent her death. I was always terrified. The abuser would sneak behind me while I was having conversations with other novices. She would often call me into her office to yell and scream at me. I was young. I became convinced that I was inferior, bad, evil, and constantly observed. There was no help from anyone. A crazy-making, exhausting, evil experience. I grew older, having experienced many years of successful teaching. I lived in convents with some very mentally ill sisters who continued the motif of attack. A laundry room in one convent became a place where older members would yell and scream that the community did not need people like me. Angry, mentally ill women against whom there was no protection. The expansion of my self-hatred and despair continued. Fast forward to years of reporting the abuse to congregational leadership. Confrontation with the abuser who denied everything. Years of having to get away from her at yearly meetings. The loss of many friends who left the community in part because of this perpetrator. Years of depression and anxiety. The, in quotes, ecclesiastical, mount, ecclesiastical mountain against which the, value, the battle for truth was and is a savage, never-ending and exhausting war. Fast forward to today. Religious congregations hold both victims and survivors and their perpetrators. The schizophrenia persists. The perpetrators enjoy the benefits of a life they have assisted in destroying for their victim. The toxicity of the lack of truth and healing leaves a dedicated mission in ruins as it does in the rest of the clerical church. Our communal delusion continues. Some things rarely change. Most often, silence is still the mode of communication. Abuse policies are upholders of protecting the perpetrators, guaranteed to continue the silence of the accusers. It is not unlike any other cycle of abuse. The fact that it happens and harbors perpetrators in an organization designed to speak truth to and with the world is its most hideous legacy. This toxic wasteland continues to become more deeply embedded in the hierarchical culture of religious communities and of the hierarchical church. It is as though the mission to influence our world has faded away in the dust of our inability to face our own in internal evil truths. We seem communally unaware of the tragedy of our history. Our current communal life rambles on as we dance on the grave of, graves of its victims. We do not acknowledge them as a group we no longer dream. I have chosen to participate in the struggle for truth from inside the institution. Yes, it is painful and difficult and sometimes heartrending. Departing from the institution allows the memory of the injured to fade away. My presence is a reminder to the whole that silences can be broken and truth can be spoken and these truths will set us free. I am no longer confused and injured as I was in my younger years. I am motivated, angry, horrified, and sad. I am convinced that silence no longer will rule the world of the institutional church. It is up to us who have survived years of abuse and its effects to speak the truth. The unsilencing of the many truths of physical, sexual, and psychological ab abuse provide a way to move beyond the delusional and, in quotes, schizophrenic world 
of denial and secrecy. So it is a lifelong burden and challenge to speak, but speak we must. Speak we must. Silence is not an option anymore. I couldn't agree more with your sister. Sister Dr. Anita Chetya is a former faculty member of College of Social Work in Mumbai, India. She's the director of a project with HIV and wrote her thesis on the transgenders of Mumbai. Thank you, sister, for telling us your truth. I must say that first of all, I've had fairly a very good experience because I relate, I can relate equally and very comfortably with all. Unfortunately, I do have some very unpleasant experiences, uh, which I'm not very happy to say, but I take it as a service to the church, service to humankind. If, I, if my sharing can help. My first uneasy experience was in around 1998 when I was in Pune doing my theology. I had gone to one parish outside JDV campus. I had gone out because I heard that one priest was from a particular place where, which I knew somewhere Mumbai or whatever you can call it. I went because I said, ah, a known person, I mean, known means known to my known person, okay. I just went there to just greet the person, the priest there, and I said, hello, father, hi, hi, nice, we introduced ourselves. He said, come, come, see my school. Uh, he was a principal. He said, come, come, I'll show you my school. I said, fine, okay. You know, I, I'm born and brought up in Bombay and in Bombay, we just relate very freely. I said, okay, I, with full trust, I went up. And as we were climbing the steps, uh, this priest came closer to me and he was like trying to uh, put his hand around my waist. Like, I, I first got a little chuck. So, he is not even my friend. I don't know him also. Then why he is taking the liberty to uh, touch me like, nah. I said, father, father, and I moved away. Uh, no, no, I just moved without saying first anything. And again, I thought the second steps again when we were climbing. Then I said, uh, I said, father, please, I don't like this. I said, no, 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 it's okay. It's just friendly gesture. I said, I'm so sorry, father. I don't like this. I said, and I said, father, let's go down. Let's go down. I didn't want you to see his food on me. I said, father, let's go down. I'm getting late. And I just ran. I came down. You won't believe. I was shivering. I got temperature. I ran to my room and I just laid down and I was shivering. And I said, is this real? That is happening to me. But I kept quiet. I didn't share this with anybody. The first was very traumatic, I must say. I was in a tribal place. I was sent for my community experience as a novice. One evening, there were some seminarians who came. They have their experience, you know, village experience. Um, three days, four days, that they used to come. And that night they were to spend their time in the village and that day unfortunately we were only two sisters so one sister said anita i'm not feeling well the senior sister can you accompany these brothers to the village i had to accompany these people there were uh, two or three of them i said okay i'll i'll go no problem i had no difficulty as such so i went there in the night in the village it was a tribal hamlet. We had our regular meeting, Gauki and uh, adult literacy class. And after that, we used to eat in the house, one of the houses, whatever was served. And uh, we would sleep in the um, house of the family. And I know it is not a comfortable at all. I mean, the cattle is there, the hens, the poultry is there, and everything is around and we have to sleep there, you know. And I have no problem. 
that day it was raining and that family was also having a problem so they asked us if you all can sleep in the um um classroom a classroom was there i said okay in order to help them i said okay i said brothers we have only this place and we cannot i cannot come down alone from the village okay okay sister okay, okay. and i i only trusted the brothers for me i have grown up with three brothers my own brothers many cousins i have really no problem you know it was all fine i think and suddenly in the middle of the night i realized someone making inappropriate uh, uh, advances towards me and i resisted i first pretended i was still sleeping and i was resisting but this fellow was really really very very um i don't know what to use the word he was he had decided that he had he wanted to make use of the opportunity he tried to really um touch my private parts and i i you know the thing is because that other one father brother was also there and i was so feeling frightened ashamed i said i god if i say something that other other brother will what he will think that we both are having some affair or what something and i'm trying to be quiet same time resisting and in between when it was getting difficult i i just got up pretending that i wanted to go to the toilet i went out of course it was in the nature and he came behind me there oh god i got so scared he came behind and anyway i escaped and i still came back there because i had no other place to go middle of the night 2 o'clock 3 o'clock how can i run home to my place convent i went back and again it was um, i it was a very dirty encounter i would say he was trying to push himself on me to penetrate and i just pushed him out almost like a what you call uh, fight na <laughs> what you uh, like uh, boxing na i was just pushing i, I had my strength i pushed him so much and i could feel he was fully excited quite hard i could feel but somehow i pushed him out and soon i felt all wet in my hands you understand what had happened so when i when it was all wetish and i was feeling so dirty and all and i said and then 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 that was the uh, my relief he stopped making advances after that as soon as little light came at about 4:35 i just came out and i had fever i got fever and i just told them i'm not well i'm going home i just ran down it was in a hamlet sir on the hills no you know i just came down running i was having fever and i straight went we had a house in our chawl system we had another room one more room i just told them i'm having fever i just went to sleep i covered myself with a blanket and i was shivering with fever i did not have courage to say this to anybody because i felt i was wrong because people will think i am bad i am wrong before making my five year vows i during my retreat in that place i saw on the notice board those please can notice board i saw that fellow was going to get ordained and i told my retreat master there i said father i'm getting disturbed with this incident so i told the retreat preacher i'm feeling disturbed my only thing is concern is this man should not go and uh, misbehave like this with other others say so then i went i went to the seminary the rector i said under under what you call uh, confessional secret i told father i don't want you to take any action because i know i am too late to come and tell you 
all these years i kept quiet i didn't tell but i want to tell you about this one person he has this weakness difficulty if you can help him because my only intention that in future he should not do the same thing with others these things uh, should not happen and even if it happens how we should uh, counteract how we should behave not get paralyzed you know numbed if i was numbed that day those days i don't know what would have happened to me luckily i had a presence of mind i could just protect myself and get out of it thank you sister nita mary dispensa a former nun is an advocate for those abused by priests her memoir split a child a priest in the catholic church chronicles her own abuse her years as a nun and her search for healing from trauma and shame we are going to listen to a very powerful voice of a survivor mary we are extremely thankful that you're here with us today and using your voice to help others to understand your struggle with the church your journey to find healing from the brokenness and create for yourself a life of wholeness again thank you chantel hello everybody i'm so delighted to be here and to connect with so many women around the world. I look behind me at a sign that I have on the wall and it says behind me, will be well-behaved women rarely make history. So I say today, let's make history. Let's change history. Let's be history especially for survivors of the past, of the present, and of the future. Today, I speak on behalf of survivors who are abused, were abused by nuns, a topic that's rarely addressed. When I heard the title of this session for the first time, the word condemned, it caused me to flash to the way of the cross a Catholic ritual that I have not visited since the Lenten season of 1992. 1992 was the year I was fired after 35 years by Archbishop Thomas Murphy from my position as director of the Pastoral Life Services Department for the Catholic Archdiocese of Seattle. Why? for acknowledging my homosexuality. It was also the, the year that I faced the truth that I was raped at age seven by the newly ordained parish priest. This was the year that the Catholic Church lost its meaning for me. I had enough. I felt betrayed, sent away, condemned, by my church, while many pedophile priests and bishops remained in the priesthood and lived outside the boundaries of their vows. Being Lent, I decided to write my own way of the cross to heal the grief and loss I was feeling. I called my first station, Mary is Condemned. Here is some of what I wrote. You arrogant church, I am angry, angry at you. Who do you think you are to tell me my life is not holy if I live it as I am, a woman loving women? My anger ignites over your righteous position. So go on, condemn me for living in truth. Continue to play your Pontius Pilate role. Your patriarchy sickens me. <clears throat> Excuse me. It seems like only yesterday that I wrote those words, and yet it was nearly 30 years ago. I have changed, 
patriarchy, power, and clericalism in the priesthood has not. Patriarchy remains the root cause of persecution, use, and abuse of women, children, and others. The same hierarchical model remains in religious orders of women today, matriarchy. It begins at the top from superior generals to provincial superiors and on down to local superiors of communities. As a facilitator of SNAP support group for those abused by nuns, many survivors share that when they went to superiors to tell their story, they were, they were met with cautiousness and less than helpful actions. I sense a code of secrecy and silence within combat walls that protects the order and the family of nuns that can be likened to the incestuous families that keep secret beyond all costs and they keep the crimes of abuse and perpetrators covered up. I've often asked myself, what if a superior or the nun in charge of serving survivors was free from protecting her sisters and the order first? No more, no more code of secrecy. Then would she be able to be truly compassionate, honest, and just as each survivor came forward? I, I do think so. Survivors want to be listened to, believed and compensated at times for the grave losses they suffer. Many tell me that they tried once when they were younger to tell a nun in power what had happened to them, but sadly, no one listened. Just recently, a survivor told me her story. When she was in high school, a nun, a teacher, made aggressive sexual advances toward her. She went to the principal. She told the principal what, principal what had happened. And the result was that she was asked to leave because she was becoming a threat to the nuns and to the school. The principal gave her family a very weak excuse saying she just didn't fit in and it might be better if she changed schools. The nun remained teaching. The survivor is still seeking answers. And another story recently shared with me by a nun sexually violated by another nun still living in community with her. She told her superior, and nothing was done. A police report was never filed. The sister abuser remains in the convent. And this is the sad part. The victim lives with the constant haunting presence of her abuser at meetings and community events. And then there are the stories of little boys and young boys sexually and physically violated by nuns, who to this day as men carry deeply rooted shame and guilt, believing because of their gender, they could have done more to stop the nun from harming them. They couldn't, of course. The power dynamic is and was just too great. I too have my own story. Finally, at age 78, just three years ago, I faced my own abuse by a nun in power, a superior. E even the word sets up a power dynamic. It is amazing to me that it can take such a long time for many of us to face and deal with the abuse in our lives. I was a nun from the late 1950s to the early 70s. My childhood abuse by the parish priest remained so deeply buried in me that it did not interfere with my love for God. Thank God. 
and my desire to be a nun. I entered the convent after school, high school at age 18. The year was 1958. Shortly after entering, I, I was leaving the chapel with my group when a superior came up and tapped me on the shoulder. She motioned me to come into her room. I, I followed her and she sat in her chair so queenly and I knelt before her so small. She took my face between her hands and she kissed my face all over. Words fade, memory fades. I left her room and the same feelings that I had when I was abused and raped by the parish priest at eight, se age seven came spilling over me. But this time I felt them more keenly and deeply. Abandonment, shame, detachment, secrecy, and mostly confusion. The novice mistress never asked me why I left the line and why I had been gone so long. I, I buried this as I did my priest abuse deep inside for almost a lifetime. It was recently that I finally named this experience for what it was. It, it wasn't just strange and creepy, as I and my women friends described it, and many other sexual acts done to them. It was an abuse of power and a crossing of boundaries with serious sexual and religious overtones for a survivor like me. It was too intimate, it was too powerful. It compounded my deeper wounds of childhood abuse, especially confusion. The good news is my story had a positive ending. I did go to the nun in charge of sexual abuse cases in my former community. I told her what happened to me. She listened, she believed me. She looked back into her files for any information she could find. She shared with me what she found. She helped me put the pieces of my story and my life together. So I am much less confused. She asked me what I needed. She told me how sorry she was that one of our nuns hurt me. I felt love. I felt validated. It was enough. We must make and hear more stories of hope like this one and be the ministers we're called to be. Here are six facts that if we take them to heart will move us to action today and change tomorrow. One, when investigations are taken away from the bishops and given to secular authorities, attorney generals, bankruptcy courts, none abuse is always at least 5% of all abuse and sometimes as high as 10%. These trends extend to the rest of the world. Wherever the church has some power and authority granted to it by governments. Two, the look back window of justice in New York has identified at least 75 nuns accused of abuse. Three, 75% of United States dioceses have publishes have published lists of their priest abusers. Not one female religious order has published a list. That secrecy is a worldwide part of the Catholic playbook regarding abuse. Four, the recent French investigation into abuse confirmed that 330,000 victims of the Catholic Church exist. 100,000 of those by lay employees and female religious. 
There are specific horror stories of nuns abusing children in France, and this unmasking is the most revealing yet. Five, despite the lack of transparency in the United States, Bishop's accountability has documented 166 female religious in its archives. And of course, we know there are many, many more. Those have come from class action lawsuits and other forced opening of files. Six, in Canada, much has been made of the life and cultural genocide of First Nations children way of life, Catholic controlled schools, and the role of priests in that genocide. But female religious are complicit in that story. So there remains so much mending, healing, and restoring to do, and we can do it. Let's stand together today as a world community and shout out in every language, no more abuse, no mas abuso. It's time to condemn criminals and acts of sexual violence and institutions who cover and protect them. It's time to embrace survivors with justice. Justice delayed is justice denied. We can do better, we will do better, and we must do better. To survivors like me, tell your story. Malawa says it this way, when the whole world is silent, even one voice is powerful. You are that voice. Know that you are not alone. We journey together, seeking healing and justice for ourselves and for others, especially for our children. Remember, it was never your fault. I want you to know that it gets better. And if you need support, go to snapnetwork.org or bishopaccountability.org or please email me at mcdispenza at comcast.net. I do care. Thank you. Bravo, Mary. You're incredible. And if I could hug you, I would, I would really. <laughs> so I give you a digital hug. <laughs> Everybody gives you a digital hug. Thank you, thank you. We go on to Barbara Hasselbeck. In 2005, she was awarded a doctorate in theology for her thesis, Sexual Abuse and Religiosity, Religiosity, When Women Break the Silence, the thesis was awarded the Dissertation Prize of the University of Passau in 2006 and has been widely received. Barbara is recognized and sought after expert on prevention and coming to terms with sexual abuse. She is particularly concerned with the female victims of sexualized violence, who for a long time received little focus in the Catholic Church. On the one hand, she reconstructs the stories of the victims, and on the other hand, she asks what helpful perspectives trauma research can open up. She pleads pastorally for a solidar for, a, for, a, for a solidary attitude of a church and theology towards the victims of sexual and spiritual abuse and consistently brings the perspective of those affected into the discourse on coming to terms with abuse. Barbara, the floor is yours. Ja, herzlichen Dank für die Vorstellung und für die Möglichkeit, hier zu sprechen. Seit gut 20 Jahren begleite Thank ich... Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I've been accompanying 
women who have experienced abuse for a good 20 years, and I want to describe to you the experiences of those affected. These experiences Dieses Buch ist vor einem Jahr hier are described in the book Storytelling as Resistance or Narrative as Resistance, which was published here in Germany a year ago. And in it, 23 women tell of sexual and spiritual abuse they experienced as adults in the church. Now, I want to group, to bundle the experiences of those affected into three first person statements that can give an insight into the inner experience of those affected and then i shall describe to you the difficulties victims or survivors have in the follow-up to their lives so the first the fundamental experience is uh, uh, thinking i am to blame we have heard this over and over again. Abuse, there are several types of um, abuse and abuse never comes so suddenly. It is embedded in a very slow strategy of initiation, in spiritual accompaniment, in confessional talks, in retreats. The woman confines in her uh, spiritual father and finally there is someone who listens who has time who's there for me and then insidiously the first assaults start the too long hug the hand on the thigh thigh the sentence i'll show you god's love the affected woman no longer knows what to do she doesn't really like this situation she's confused and no longer trusts her own perception what happens in the abuse it shames the woman it creates a situation a feeling of shame in her she takes over the feelings that actually belong on the side of the abuser she begins to believe that she herself is involved that she's the guilty person in the story she's emotionally at the mercy of the abuser and in this total dependency it is easier to assume one's own guilt than to realize that someone has made a woman the plaything of his power the moment victims talk about abuse they always have to expect that those around them will blame them then they hear sentences like well she's an adult and she can say no so this uh, sentence is nothing more than an apportionment of blame. Second fundamental experience, the feeling that I am a puppet. I am a puppet. In her account in the book, narrative as a resistance, a victim describes in a very stark and blunt way how she felt. She says, I had become a puppet in his hands. The perpetrator manipulated her spiritually and the physical assaults were presented as a proof of Jesus' love. By interpreting biblical passages, he demanded absolute obedience from the woman who was inescapably at his mercy. She, she had become a puppet Whoever pulled the strings of the puppet, she would do what was demanded of her. And this inner experience of not being able to act for oneself can become very deeply engraved in our soul. And the third fundamental experience, I am alone in a situation of abuse the affected person feels all alone she feels all alone with the abuse experience and often that remains for a long time it is the inner silence on the one hand and a church environment in which abuse may not be spoken about on the other hand that reinforce and cement the isolation and in spite of these inner experiences 
that as that is i am to blame i feel like a puppet i am alone those affected have begun to talk about the abuse eventually these women are brave and strong because their storytelling is dangerous for them they must always expect the difficulties which i will describe now in the second part of my sharing and again i will talk about three aspects three points the first experience the experience of uh, abused women is they're told this is your personal problem that is the individual case theory if a woman as an adult experiences abuse in the church or uh, and speaks about it this has an impact on the whole system into which she speaks for example if the woman lives in a community as a religious for example her speaking about the abuse unsettles the self-image of the community as a whole and her fellow sisters it is an imposition to imagine how the fellow sister became a victim and no one noticed anything it is just unbearable to imagine that compassion and spiritual accompaniment became dangerous places victims therefore often experience that their experience of abuse is declared is considered to be an individual problem and it is easier to assume that it is an individual case than to question their own structures and institutional self-image is smaller the person affected is aware of this she's told this abuse is your problem that is your personal problem and this of course reinforces the feeling of being all alone second experience now we need to be good the stigmatization as a victim victims are increased now you need to be good to behave good victims increasingly increasingly experience that church and religious leaders initially react empathetically cautiously and with partiality they are listened to and encouraged to report the abuse but it is extremely difficult for the person concerned to be constantly confronted with the difficult and often traumatizing experiences that she has um, had she holds on to the hope that things will get better that justice will be done to her but experience shows that proceedings take years and the affected person is poorly informed that she has to endure this pending state and, and in the end what will be desirable very rarely comes out and the most agonizing reaction to talking about the abuse is that silence ensures there are no reactions people around the victims become impatient they want the continued suffering to end the person affected reacts now she needs to be good she feels branded as a, a difficult person and again she's the one who is somehow to blame for not doing well for not behaving good she's so she becomes the scapegoat again the black sheep and i see women leaders and decision makers in communities who accompany those affected with patience partiality and attentiveness however i also come across sentences that say someone really has to keep this issue at bay affected people are pigeonholed and confronted with contemptuous cliches about them point number three love can bear anything the danger of spiritual narcotization i observe a specifically catholic way in which the scandal of abuse against adult women especially women religious is spiritually dismissed the event is spiritually dressed up spiritual ideals 
foster a climate in which abuse can occur and continue. The willingness to surrender, to override one's own needs and be obedient, not to assert one's own head, one's own mind, to be ready for forgiving love. All these are ideals that make it difficult for those affected. I, I see women who try again and again to come to terms with the uh, spiritual abuse, remembering that the abuser is only a human by forgiving and bearing with love. They feel the pressure of expectation from their own environment that as uh, a Christian, it would be good for her to act out as uh, to act out of Christian ideals. But in the short term, this narcotizes the pain. In the long term, however, post-traumatic symptoms reappear. The victim continues to feel bound to the perpetrator like a puppet and falls into the role of a failure. We in the Christian congregations and communities have to question ourselves critically whether these spiritual ideals that promoted the abuse are the attitudes to deal with the abuse. You know, there is an exclamation mark on the book after the, wor the word enough, enough exclamation mark. People need to speak up. This is fundamental. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mary, thank you all the others. I've been asked now at the end, if you have questions. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Mary. Thank you all. As a matter of fact, we have that was our last uh, testimonial. And uh, if you have questions, you can ask them to Mary and Barbara. Du hast gesagt, wir müssen Geschichte schreiben. Und ich würde sagen, ihr schreibt. We are called to write history. I would say that you are already doing it. Each and every day you are writing history. All the people, all the victims and survivors are making history. I am really grateful for your commitment. Thank you, Barbara, for what you shared. If you have questions, just feel free to ask them directly. No, sorry, to write them there in the chat box. My question is, why it takes so long sometimes before being capable of facing such a trauma? We know from psychological research that the soul, by traumatic experiences, reacts with mechanisms that the victim protects. And it is when the attack is so hard to protect victims because sometimes mechanisms of defense take place that the very soul of the person of the victim actually experiences a separation from what happened uh, it separates itself from the whole experience and this experience itself can just stay in a intimate corner of our soul for a long time and i can see the experiences of these persons and i know that these experiences are so hard and they feel so guilty that they also believe that there is no solidarity concerning their experience they actually take action only when they feel they have enough resources and when they feel safe that there will be people who will believe them thank you i would like also to say to our participants to write the questions in the chat and mary a question for you actually because you talked about the fact that women can be reporters reporters of sexual abuse uh, when they accuse 
priests, and you also talked about the fact that they can report crimes. Why do you think that people speak so few, just so few about it? Please unmute yourself, Marie. Sorry. Mary, please unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I believe it's very difficult oh, for women to speak out and especially women in religious orders that may have been uh, abused by other other nuns uh, we were taught respect deference uh, not not to be uh, not to speak until we were spoken to and things of that sort and and even for women it, it, in general we we too have been taught to be quiet um, and not to come forward. And it's just recently that we're becoming stronger, realizing that we have a voice, we have power, and we can make a difference. So it really takes it takes time for us to shift the paradigm we've grown into to a new one, a new history, or sometimes we say her story, her story now. We need her stories and her bravery. And um, that's some of my thoughts. Thank you, Shin. Um, Thank you know, very much. And a last question, uh, which I believe you can all answer if you want. Uh, what do you think could be the next step uh, for now, for the moment being? What would be, be uh, more important to do? Would you like to make an appeal to someone who wants to start? Okay, well, Mary? I, I would like to make an appeal to Super. the Leadership Conference of Religious Women. That is the organi leadership organization in the United States. I would like them to begin to speak about the problem, to address it, to eventually release the names of credibly abused um, nuns. And I would like the, um, the Superior General's Union of the United States of America, I'm sorry, of, of the world to do the same thing. And I, I would also like a diocese um, around the United States, maybe other countries too, to start listing the names of nuns, credibly accused nuns. Right now, in most cases, just, just priest names are listed. So, I would like a dialogue between especially the Leadership Council of Religious Women and survivors um, to hear our voices, uh, to, to work together on some of these problems. We could do so much more if we would put aside protecting others, our, <clears throat> our orders and individuals, and come together to make this, this problem better. Thank you, Mary. Barbara. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Barbara. Now your final appeal. Well, my desire would be that those who are in charge of the various communities accept this challenge and these people who want to speak out may really feel safe in doing that 
and may feel empowered to speak out. And so maybe we could also give power to nuns who don't feel like speaking out to speak out eventually. This is a healing process. And so I will really encourage to well, I would really encourage everyone to do that. There is a way to do something. And mm -hmm. so even those who are in charge should be encouraged to take mm -hmm. action. I would like to say them that yes, through their actions, we can really see if they are really following Christ and they can really make the change and make the difference. On the one hand, we can be considered as part of our communities and also complicits in crimes. Otherwise, we can really be considered as important weapons against abuse. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everyone. And thank you all because we have been writing history. And now I'm going to give the floor to Chantal. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all again. We, we want to look tomorrow on the issue of racism in the church from a female perspective. So tomorrow at four o'clock CET would be nice to see you all again. And thank you, Mary, Barbara, all the speakers we heard on video, Ute for organizing the questions <laughs> question thank you so much and for us here in the german speaking countries tonight is santa claus so happy santa claus evening and hope to see you again here thank you and thank you have a good day and a good evening